come and visit. There's no one here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, this is a real collection of uh, Intel pros we've got lined up here. And one student. <laughs> One student who knows almost as much as we do right by now. She's yes, yeah. she's the one who asks all the questions. Yeah. Well, if I could just uh, maybe absorb like a fraction of what you guys could all dump in thirty seconds, that that would be great. <laughs> so how, did, how did Brian's go earlier? It's good, I think. Yeah, I liked it. Did so he, I think that the notebook was really cool. Uh, if we add the data set to the collection so that people can actually run it, it uh, would be even better. But the, uh... Well, I was thinking, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, it could be a great project since he has all the steps. If people, uh, and he provides all the information you need, people could run TopSAP on those two pairs that he provided and then run his script to get the offsets and just replicate it, that would be a good exercise, I would think. Yeah, I, I have tracked down all the data files and all the orbit files. I'm slowly plugging, well, I took a little time off, but uh, I, start, I, will, I was slowly plugging through, getting everything in the right places so that it would run. But you don't have the DEM, right? I do, but I, oh. I need to reproject it. I also found the dem. Yeah, <laughs> you have that that specific uh, one or a different dem. I have the dem that he said he was using, but it is a four gigabyte file, so I probably would want to crop it before. Yeah, I think it's probably good enough if you wanted to to get the uh, Copernicus thirty dm, the Glow thirty. Wow, so I got I got the whatever it is, the Remo. I have it. I just. Need to do some GDAL. As Peter Shaw used to say, the yes. rest of GDAL. <laughs> the rest <is> <laughs> Trivial. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I guess everybody just understands everything. So no need to have to come to office hours. <laughs> That's how it works in my undergrad classes. We don't have office hours tomorrow, right? Uh, in the evening. That is correct. It's on my calendar for some reason, but we just in the morning, just at seven. Yeah, seven. I don't know why it's on the. Uh, I plan to be drinking beer at five p.m. tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> I might start a little earlier. <laughs> That's quite possible too. Yeah. I have one left in my my office fridge from the uh, European Championship soccer. <laughs> It was necessary, actually, from England v Germany. Oh, <clears throat> that didn't go so well. Oh, it went great. <laughs> I don't know what you're about. <laughs> Depends on who you ask here, okay? <laughs> well, I thought from your perspective, uh, Gareth. <laughs> I I'm curious about the game with Italy. How many beers were consumed during that one? <laughs> A lot, many more. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I could see it all happening, in, you know, in advance. Like, yeah, we're just going to drop deeper and deeper and stop trying to play, and then we'll lose. And it took longer than I thought it would, but we still managed it. But you, you pulled through, didn't you? <laughs> I know a couple of where she is. She is British and he is Italian. I think they're still married. <laughs> Big soccer fans, both living in Liverpool. So, yeah, that's a place to watch soccer. Oh, it's a light group today, huh? Um, I I do actually have a question. Should should I? Yes. Start asking. Okay. Break the ice, literally. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, it's related on the uh, Okada uh, modeling from from yesterday. Okay. Um, maybe I'll go ahead and share my screen if that's all right. Yep. Uh, so I was using the uh, data that was part of the initial tops case 
uh, which was from the, the Monte Cristo earthquake. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of wanted to just go through the process of uh, running the model. And I, th I think you mentioned uh, that it's not going to look pretty because it's uh, another one of those cross faults. Um, but it looks less pretty than I expected, and I can't quite find my error. Um, but so, so my general process was to kind of take the the individual notebooks notebooks and put them all into one to kind of roll through everything. Well, I probably should have done myself. Yeah, um, yeah you know, actually, it was a, a really great um, way to think about the sequence and the learning. So uh, it made me actually look at each cell and think about it. So I, uh, it was really helpful actually to have them split in that sense. Um, so for the initial parameters, I figured I might as well just look at the USGS event page and oh, yeah. yeah, right, and then try to do it that way. So I started off just making the simple model, just like you had in your, your first book. Uh, the I guess just the um, kind of basic theoretical model and resolving into a line of sight. And okay. then I went through with uh, actually taking the uh, the uh, INSAR data that we had from the TOPS uh, exercise and going through the whole quad tree and Oka Pi. And then um, th so that was kind of the process there. Um, I just inferred uh, length from just a basic M log 4A relationship. And um, I inferred slip from uh, mu AD, a uh, moment based on the magnitude. Uh -huh. uh, just kind of just has some basic starting small. points. That seems very small. For a 6.5 earthquake, well, I don't know. You've got a very long fault, I guess. Yeah, um, I was surprised also that it 6.5 and 26 kilometers is not what I expected, but um, I'll probably try 1. 15 kilometers and one and a half meters or something, but I don't know. Okay, yeah. Um, this is, you know, kind of a just rule of thumb thing. I think the real best regressions are more like 4.2, and, you know, the, there's half a dozen different ways, but yeah. yeah. I, I know about that, yeah, for sure. Yeah, 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 sure, yeah. And I just assumed a 12 kilometer width. Um, I was a little sloppy. I probably should have actually done the basic trig, but whatever, for first order, um, it's probably okay for starting. Uh, so I use strike, dip, and rake, of course, from the, the USGS, like I mentioned. Okay, and you're going with the, the, the north-south plane, not the east-west one? Oh, yeah, uh, good, good point. Um, so I tried both. And they both look terrible. And this was just the most recent one that I did. Um, <laughs> okay. I think the other one's probably better, but. Yeah, I started off that way. Um, uh, but <laughs> yeah, I, I should rerun it that way that I also thought that the East West was more appropriate. Um, yes, I it's a dim recollection of the, the rupture pattern being like uh, having two East West planes with a step between them. Yeah, yeah. I think Alex, uh, the other Alex, may have mapped it. We should really ask her. I uh, hate him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's all fracture mapping out there. I mean, nothing really broken. It's a total mess. Um, but okay. Uh, so, yeah. so notwithstanding uh, that, uh, let's see. What do we have? Initial model parameters. Um, this is all your uh, kind of rotations, conversions. So, running the model. Um, so yeah, this, this, this is fine because that your fault has almost no slip. It doesn't look like anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the um, the actual slip amplitudes from the data are this model is like half an order of magnitude higher than the slip amplitudes from the data, which is actually kind of I guess maybe if I um, kind of skip to the points. Uh, yeah, actually, just kind of skipping to the point. So I, I was curious what that theoretical model is. So that's what we just looked at, but I changed the colors to be a you know diverging scale. Um, these are the data. Yep. Right, and then the forward model is just horrible. You might not even be able to see it on your screen because it's the slip amplitudes are so small. And um, yeah. if I you know I print this uh, down here as, as well, you know we're looking at you know less than a centimeter. Was it really that little of the displacement in the earthquake? I thought it was bigger than that. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, so bigger I don't than, remember the... Eight centimeters. I don't remember the, the field measurements other than there's, oh, there was the really no continuous the, proper the field fault field measurements trace. are like 10 centimeters, but they're also not really 
that this, that this probably means that the slip was on the earthquake was buried deeper than than the surface rupture. I thought there were I thought the displacement was bigger than what you're showing. I, okay. I, I can't remember. Um, well, let's let me just confirm. Maybe I grabbed the wrong files. Um, Can we do you, do you could you show this the the interferogram plotted um, unwrapped uh, did before, I, it, before any conversions or anything? Uh, so there's the SC displacement. No. Okay. Um, yeah. Well. Yeah, it doesn't look very big, does it? Yeah. Oh, this, but it was a while ago. Um, um, did you did you want me to plot? Um, did I not move it in? No, oh, no, oh, no, it's okay. I, I need to go. I need to go okay. back and check my my files because um, I have an interferogram for this. Just to just to set. Okay. Fine. Yeah. I guess the 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 kind of the short of it was. I mean, this first order comparison of the side being positive without side being negative uh, checks with the data. Mm. You know, the you know, the strike is a little bit off, whatever. But like I, yeah, the, <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> and I expected that to be more all right. <laughs> yeah. Uh... Well. Um, and it and it doesn't get better, kind of using the the more uh, kind of the inverse uh, effort sets, you know, your, the, the randomized starting points. Um, yeah, still kind of the same problem and using the, um, uh, you know, I didn't plot it, but when it gives just you zero assume slip it's not like better. That, it, it means that basically putting slip on the fault is worse than, than, than not having a slip at all. <laughs> so that means the model is just, it doesn't fit at all. Okay. Like no model is, is going to fit in that geometry. Well, that's kind of what it's doing. Yeah, I have to go back and look at what I did for this. I, I, I hacked around with the earthquake for a day or two. And then we look, yeah. Okay. It just doesn't, it's not an easy one to model. I, 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 you're very brave taking it on. I would also maybe you don't have enough data points to really cap characterize the, the full deformation pattern just from looking at that. You might want okay. to lower your variance threshold and have to yeah, reduce the uh, threshold a bit. <clears throat> yeah, there could be a lot oh. of averaging being done also close to the fault, maybe. Uh, two yeah, points. I mean, sometimes you, you want to have a few more points in the areas where you transition from deformation to no deformation to capture the edge of the deformation slightly better. Yeah, right. So here it goes from these little squares to this giant one, right? Yeah. You probably want something a little better. What, yeah. um, Half that like, like point oh, or just point oh one or? Point oh one for, that's a good yeah. first. All right. Hack okay, it. cool. I'll, I'll take a crack at it. Um, and I can, uh, yeah, but thanks for talking through that. Um, I'll let it run and I can stop sharing so that uh, someone else can ask a question because it sounded like we're building more of an audience now. Where'd my thing go? Oh, you know what? Actually, it's almost done. Let's just go look. It's so fast. Huh? Yeah, I would also try the other the the east west point. Yeah. Okay. It uh, seemed like it was at least more signal. Yeah, it was a better collection of points. Uh, I think that's what these. Oh no, that was the other one. The other thing I can think of is that you you probably well I don't know how big a how wide a bounds you've placed on the the, the surface location of. The, the fault, the location you give is basically the center of the fault plane as it projects to the surface. So normally you would look for a, the, the middle of the, the color transition between negative and positive or something, you put it there. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure, and it, it, yeah, without giving it a lot of room for maneuver. Yeah. 
So I'd put yeah. it about halfway along to the right from where you are. Halfway along to the right. Oh, like, I'm sorry, can you say it one more time? Like, I, I, I think I put it at 420 and 420. I would put it more five. like 430 and 420, 4230. Yeah. So Alrighty. Uh, yeah but the one one thing you can do is just give it really big bounds in the x and y coordinates um in the inversion anyway okay oh she so said 430 and um was that there maybe uh like four so that transition from blue to green is probably like where the fault might be this guy right here Somewhere around there, yeah. yeah but very. Uh, 423. Oops, scrolling the wrong way. All blue. Is there also a, a variant uh, uh, um, carrot where once you have fixed the geometry, that there is a, an inverse model? Um, I have that, but it, I didn't show it. I only. I, I took an hour and five minutes as it was, or was it an hour, but slightly longer. Okay, was, next, I, next I year we go to two week course. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll go back to full days, um, but in person. But he also had like 50 notebooks. <laughs> I had six and I only used four of them. Yeah, we need to, we'll have a lessons learned and come up with some tweaks for next year. Okay, well, I, I, I think I've, there's no obvious fix to this. Um, this oh, looks okay. worse. Um, I don't know what that is, that's exciting. Um, but yeah, okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, play around with it a little bit more. Yeah, I think we should find you a better earthquake to look at. There. I think this one requires two or three set fault segments and, and the code set up to do one right now. Well, um, if the, we seem to be having a handful of these kind of uh, cross fault earthquakes. You've got the Ridgecrest and Monte Cristo and um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> time, time to update the code. <laughs> Cross faults are fashionable right now. <laughs> and may I um, update my new result? To sure. You? Okay. Since we're talking about the um, your physical it. model. So, um, yeah, I, first of all, you're right, Karis. I thought rake of one is right lateral, but that's left lateral. So I was modeling right lateral strike slip with crest faulting as left lateral, which is the. So after I change the rake as minus 180, it, it works very well. And I thought about why it work when I change the sign of the horizontal components of pointing vector, because I treat right lateral slip as left lateral and it's a strike slip. So when I change the sign, even though I treat it as left lateral, the model think it's a right lateral. That's why it worked. So right now, um, my, um, Pointing vector looks like descending, right? Yep. Uh, yeah, I learned a lot from my mistake. Thank you for um, correcting me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can, for, sorry, I can uh, remember right right when you were saying it, what way round the earthquake was supposed to go. Like, yeah. All the faults in California were right lateral, like, apart from the cross faults. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I just like this. Um, this image here, it, I, I can even see the conjugate yeah. part a little bit. But thank you, and sorry again. 
no, no problem. That's you can see all the re all the sort of the shortcomings of the model are that you know the fault is, has has got curvature to it. It does not. It's not exactly straight. So in your residuals, you could see where it wasn't matching the surface trace very well. Right. Uh, I, speaking of that, when I add more patches, more than I don't know, maybe one hundred. When I want to use a hundred, is it uh, they are are they linearly? Or imposed, or which modeling outputs I should do. So the the when it, when you mean when you do the looping, it's not adding more faults. It's um, it's just choosing a different starting model, and then iterating towards the best another another local minimum in in this fit for you know another single fault plane that that tries to match the deformation pattern. Um, there's a whole other step beyond this where you, which David mentioned, <laughs> yes, you can then fix the fault geometry, expand, extend the fault and divide the fault up into smaller pieces and solve for the slip on all of those. And I have a notebook that does that. And it might, you might even be able to find it somewhere on the system because along with the UNAVCO course in Geosync, there's all these other notebooks actually from, from um, a course that course materials that Paul and I and others are developing and France for a set semester long graduate class, which are all embedded in that download that's on the OSL. So you might be able I, to find it. I can, I, I should try to dig out some cool notebooks. Yeah, I'm not sure if I put that one up there, but it, it might be there. And if not, I do have it, <laughs> of course, but it, yeah. It, it's, it's fiddly and it's not it's not very not very polished and not finished not not ready to present to 150 eager um, <laughs> attendees um, can I ask you um, for sharing you know any any work that I can start with how do you mean because I, I want to add a little bit more patches. You know, oh, on. okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, well, you, it's just a linear sum, right? You linear add another sum. patch, you would have to evaluate two sets of fault parameters. Um, and it could do that. You probably would have to write a new penalty function because I think right now it only, only solves one set of fault parameters. I mean, this is something I want to I want to do at some point. <laughs> so uh, um, I can think about it, <laughs> but right now I don't have a version that does it. Thanks. <laughs> so one um, Okada model is non-linear, though, right? For one patch, but if I use multiple patches, between patches, I can just sum linearly. Uh, if you fix their geometry, yeah. so if you know the depth and you know the 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 long strike coordinates, you know the endpoints of, of every segment, you know the dip. If you fix everything but the slip, you can solve the slip. I see. So maybe I should use um, seismic constraint. Or um, you can you can you can look at the interferogram and you can see where the fault is. For the depth, the depth maybe your your model will already tell you what the depth is, because the 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 width of the deformation pattern is controlled by how deep the fault goes. Um, so you probably have a fairly good estimate for the for the depth of the fault already. It, no, we know it ruptured the surface, so you, so you can fix it at the surface. The dip is close to vertical. You can probably go quite a long way just from mapping the location of the fault on the interferogram. So, uh, may I ask you one last question about um, your uh, slip model? Uh -huh. um, um, I'm wondering about the Y component that uh, you, you told us inside cannot resolve Y component because of the geometry. And if we use inside to model fault slip does the model underestimate 
many times if the book geometry um, is about? I'm going to say no. Um, and the reason is that the even if it doesn't directly measure the the displacement um, in the north component, the 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 effects of the displacement in the north component in the other components are still um, are still diagnostic of that pattern and the amount of slip you get. So yeah, even though you don't directly measure north south deformation, you still see the effect of it on the interferogram. And the amplitude of the deformation that you see is, is still linearly related to the amount of slip in the moment release. So yeah, the, all of all of the all of that I showed you was because of the BAM earthquake, which is basically a, a straight north south fault um, that was strike slip. Um, but we have a very good constraint on its on its moment, even though we didn't measure directly the slip. We we measured you know the, the deformation at the ends of the fault. But we match the seismic moment to derive seismically without the moment from our model. So we're not losing anything. Yeah, that's that's good news. Thank you. Thank yeah, for it's good, isn't it? <laughs> I actually did a joint model, joint inversion as well with seismology, and, and yeah, the, the results were pretty consistent. What about GPS? There's no GPS there. <laughs> it's in the middle of the desert in Iran. Um, yeah. I think there's, there may be campaign GPS now, but there wasn't any then. There were French groups that went out there and did GPS in the, sort of the 2000s, but um, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm, there was I'm, there was no GPS before the earthquake in that particular case. Uh, thank you. Others have joined. Any questions? So there was a question before about the, uh, and I'm uh, looking at Paul about NISAR and the left looking and Sentinel. And I know uh, Garrett, we had a discussion that it would help with the North South. Um, I was trying to get my head around a little bit and I was wondering um, if we could have the discussion here because it has come back before. I wonder how much it really does help us with the North South. There is indeed a variation between left and right looking um, you have a slightly different variation, let's say for a given pixel on the ground that it might have a, a different incidence angle. But um, let's assume that you don't have that variation. Then uh, if you would be making a design matrix where you're look using the line of sight, then um, one column would be the minus one of the other column in terms of the uh, uh, sensitivity. And it would, it would kind of reduce the... Uh, um, uh, it would become a rank deficient matrix. So it doesn't add much constraint. Um, so I wonder, is there a way how we can easily test that? Perhaps yeah. uh, as a homework assignment uh, with one of the uh, inversions which we have from, from the Pyroco and the Kite to kind of double check on that. Yes, we can do it. Yeah. Um, I think it does help, but I wonder how much it helps because you would still, you, you would need to have a, a diverse incidence angle from the two in order to not make them, um, let's say the minus one. Um, but I, I think your sensitivity to the north side remains predominantly limited by the satellite orbit. So the, the azimuth angle. Um, so I don't know how much it, it will, it will help a little bit, but I don't think it resolves our problem yet of, uh, of the, uh, the north side sensitivity. I think that idea which was being discussed about uh, squinting forward and backwards, uh, et cetera, that, that would give you enough angle diversity, I think, for that, that problem. But I haven't really done the calculation. <laughs> I don't know if somebody else has done. I think we did it for uh, the ECHO proposal back in 1996. <laughs> I wasn't there. <laughs> no, you, you weren't. You might not have been born yet. 
<laughs> I was in college. Uh, I was around. <laughs> I, I think we did that calculation because it, for Echo, we were, uh, it was literally a vanilla uh, LVAN single frequent, single polarization SAR. Uh, just a strip map with electronic scanning capability or roll capability, depending on the version. And so over time, we would build up this, uh, it was in an eight day repeat. Each of the swaths was 120 kilometers. So you could get 360 kilometers if you took three cycles to get it. And then you flip the spacecraft around and left. So it was a pretty dumb idea, but it was much better than anything else that existed at the time. Uh, and, and therefore we had left, right, ascending and descending observations in the concept over time, if you built it up over time. And so there was a calculation in the proposal. I can't remember the result, but we did argue that we did improve the North South by a factor of, I think, if I, if I remember correctly as a factor of 10 or something over if you just had the one. So it does improve it. But not. You're right. It's not great. It's not as. What good I great. what I remember is that for the Kumamoto earthquake, they they took a left lateral, they left looking acquisition of Alos two, so that there is data out there that we could actually really test it with, if you, if you wanted. Yeah, and there was a recent example from Morishita who wrote the Lake Espas code. He did the uh, same thing using ALOS2 strip map with both ascending, descending, left and right looking to check the 3D deformation on one of the eruptions in the Japanese volcanoes. I just will actually put the link for the paper on the chat if you're interested. Cool. Thank you, Yunjin. Sure. I don't, volcano things never really show up in my, in my searches. <laughs> Google has you pegged. Yeah. Do, we, do we have any other questions? For, then, then I will ask one again for, for history purposes. Why is US making left looking SARS and the rest of the world right looking SARS? Oh, you missed the uh, explanation of that that oh. I gave earlier. It's already on the recording. I can repeat uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you listen to the recording, David? <laughs> I will need to go that. I will find that two days of time, at least. But you should know you're on the science team. <laughs> Were you doing that just for the benefit of those on the call? No, yeah, indeed. I know that we are trying to close gaps uh, from the other observation patterns, but I think historically, even before that, uh, there were already uh, the, the left looking SARS. Um, oh, well, the airborne SARS looked to the left. That's true. Yeah. I'm cited in that paper. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> for my 3D model of uh, the BAM earthquake. Which we used azimuth offsets for, uh -huh. and, azimuth, and you that even though obviously they were terribly noisy, it was still better than not having them. Right. You can see actually all the noise in the north component comes from all from the noisy azimuth offsets. So in this paper by Morishita, do they compare the performance? with and without the uh, left looking, or is it just the result for the full 3D solution? They compare it with GPS, I think. So, I mean, if they don't do the comparison, then David may still be right that there's no difference between 3D and 2D accuracy. <laughs> or, or limited, that's what I mean. I, I don't think there is no difference. There should be some diversity, but I wonder how much, because you're still limited by the. Uh, the geometry you read Tim Wright's paper though, right? That it has, uh, has uh, it tries to do it with two different incidences of um, radar sat data. Yeah, so 15 degrees of, of uh, incidence angle difference, yeah. and you just get a horrible mess. Let's see if I can find the echo proposal on my. 
So, so we, we, for example, did it for UAV SAR over the Sacramento Delta, and the flight lines were, um, there was actually a flight line which would fly one way and then would fly the other way back exactly over the same location. And for us, when we were doing the inversion, it, it predominantly uh, was leading to rank, uh, rank deficiency. So um, if, if it looks too similar, then it was just canceling out in, in, in one of the columns and didn't constrain. The ideal pattern for, for you a VSAR would really be a diamond uh, pattern which you fly and then you would have very good constraint, um, which I think uh, either uh, was it Brian Real or Brent Minchow did uh, uh, at Caltech for, for Iceland. So I think they, they optimized one of the acquisition patterns like that. That's right. Right. Importance of network. Wow, look at this. I have all these proposals. Amazing. Yeah, 30 years of unsex unsuccessful proposals. <laughs> well, we all have that. <laughs> Remember, it's not launched yet. That's right. I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah, believe me, we're all the same. We're all feeling the same right now. So Morishita seems to suggest that the the north component uncertainty is much smaller with the ones where they use the left looking than when they use the uh, um, along track measurements as the extra um, measurement diversity. Okay. So it might be all right. <clears throat> But did it compare it to right only? Uh, or they compare it to um, right only or left only plus azimuth offsets or azimuth displacements. It's actually MAI that they compare it to. Yeah, I think once you add in the, the azimuth component, then, then you add in a significant constraint, I think. I mean, as long as the event is big enough. But also a significant amount of noise in those observations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, indeed. That looks like a pretty cool paper. Thanks for sharing, Yunjin. Yeah, yeah. I will write this in with interest. Any other questions? Can I ask you one quick question, David? Um, somehow I have two different area directory on my OSL. I think I cloned one of them, area demo and area tool stocks. Which one I should go over? For the uh, yeah, so um, I, I just uh, give you the, the clone command to, to not uh, Overwrite the initial repo which you already had. So the bot actually, if you didn't run them, they should be exactly the same repositories. Um, it's just that when we were cloning, it was cloning in a, into a local folder. I see. Thank you. It was a blast for the past for some of you. This was our logo for the third version of the ECHO proposal, which was with DDA and Kness. Excel still existed. This is uh, the JERS Kobe earthquake image. And we had L and C band on this spacecraft. Yeah. 
And that was 96? I think that one was no, 2000 or 2001. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. What was the Kobe, the Kobe earthquake then? That was more... 95, I think. Yeah, oh. it was quite a bit earlier, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, that was just a proposal. That was not a satellite that imaged that. That was imaged by JERS. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't see that these proposals actually don't open anymore. Word and PowerPoint have changed too much. The Windows uh, 95, something. But yeah, I need that, something like that. I have a virtual machine with Windows XP hermetically sealed within it, which I used to run certain things. In a lot of businesses, they use Windows XP until quite recently, you know, it was a tough transition away from that. Yeah, even in healthcare facilities. They're all getting hacked, yeah. Yeah. Well, if you wait long enough, right, your operating system is so archaic that nobody hacks it anymore. It's not worth <laughs> it. <laughs> so <only> two users. <laughs> Like COBOL programmers came back back in fashion, right? With all these old old mainframe databases that needed to be revived or transferred, <clears throat> and they didn't have anyone who knew how to program them anymore. Those retired programmers were kind of lured back with huge paydays. Yeah, it's like a pension plan. Learn how to program something archaic. Or trend, say. Nothing wrong with Fortran. All right, no other questions? Guess not. Well. Do it like a, a an auctioneer. Going once, once, going twice. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, if there are no other questions, I think uh, it's uh, time for some of us to prepare dinner. So happy to sign off if if uh, nobody has any questions. Going once, going twice. Sold. All right, we'll see you all at seven in the morning for those of you who want to join and uh, otherwise 10 o'clock. Uh, good evening, everyone, or wherever you are, have whatever it is. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>